Welcome to the Like Phil podcast. This is John Faithful Hamer. I'm going to be having the second part of a discussion with Professor Frederick Bodie of Concordia University. Uh, we promised this that we'd have you back, Fred. Welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here once again. Yeah. So last time we were talking about evangelicals and politics and Trump and all that stuff, and then we got onto the topic of Hollywood, and we wanted to continue that conversation. So. Um, you recently gave a conference paper on Hollywood and living in Hollywood and the culture of, of sort of extras and people trying to make it in Hollywood. Can you just talk a little bit about what the paper is about and what the larger project it's sort of going to be a part of is? Well, the topic of the, um, of the conference, uh, Film and History, was home. So I geared the paper towards the idea of home and people leaving home and attempting to find a new home. Can you leave home? Can you go back home? Can you really find a new home? So it was really about people trying to find a home in Hollywood as they came there with stars in their eyes to uh, try to get into the movies. So I looked at uh, Hollywood really as a geographical area rather than simply Hollywood as the film industry and tried to find out something about the lives of people who actually lived there, uh, most of whom were not in the film industry themselves, but many of whom, of course, were and many more uh, wanted to be in it. So it was a place uh, mostly lower middle class, working class, uh, with people working as jobs at jobs as waitressing, bartenders, automobile mechanics, store clerks, things like that, in addition to working actually in the movies, mostly as technicians, mostly or extras, or in some cases, bit players. So these were the people I trying and still trying to get a handle on. What was it like? Why did they come there? How did they come there? What did they find? How could they survive? Mm. Well, one thing I found fascinating in your charts was where you demonstrated how cities like Chicago, which, you know, for all the, during the Great Depression, had, you know, very, very little kind of population growth, a little bit, tiny little bit, whereas uh, L.A. was adding, like, what, 600,000 people or something like that? It was yeah, They had a yeah. lot of immigration. Mm -hmm. So clearly, when everybody else is kind of despairing, when the birth rate is way down, which is always a, a clear indication that people don't have a lot of faith in the future, people are anxious about the, the future, here you have L.A. is still kind of adding population big time, and it's largely because people are coming there to try and make it in Hollywood somehow, right? Well, that's one of the reasons people were coming there. Probably most people were actually coming to Los Angeles for different reasons. It was a large city. It had a million and a half people, the city itself, mm -hmm. not even counting the, the metropolitan area, by 1940. And the uh, migration during the 1930s remained high, although not nearly as high as it had been in the 1920s. The growth rate then was really huge, but it continued high. And, uh, you know, for some of the reasons uh, that, well, reasons that are pretty obvious, um, people went there because they thought they could get jobs. The West was always looked upon as the land of opportunity. And, of course, there were still people moving there uh, who uh, were retiring, who wanted to go there for the climate, that sort of thing. Uh, it also got a lot of people coming from uh, the Dust Bowl states, people, mm. you know, the, uh, the, the Grapes Okies, of Wrath, yeah. the Grapes of Wrath people, the John Steinbeck yeah. people, the Okies, the Arkies, uh, who came to Los Angeles, not with dreams of getting into the movies, but with hopes that they could somehow survive there. But one of the interesting things I found was California, well, California is often associated with people coming from the Dust Bowl, the Okies and the Arkies, the John Steinbeck people. And to California as a whole, this, this was the largest source of migrants in the 1930s, but not to Los Angeles. I'm the state that actually had the largest number of people coming, 
came to Los Angeles was New York. Wow. Uh, and Illinois was second. So a lot of those people were leaving Chicago because the growth of Chicago, as you said, was very small. It was actually, uh, there was net out migration uh, from Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, people were coming uh, to Los Angeles, as I say, for a variety of reasons. And many of those thought Hollywood. I think they moved to Hollywood, the Hollywood district of Los Angeles, uh, because of its association with glamour, with fame, with the opportunity of being in the movies and so on. Yeah. The one thing in your paper that I was sort of intrigued by is you talk about how, on the one hand, there's this big allure, come to Hollywood, you'll be famous, you can make your life, you can get all this stuff. But at the same time, there's these exposés that are coming out that are saying, oh, this is all a lie. These magazines are enticing you in, but you're actually going to have dashed hopes. And I'm wondering if maybe the the exposés that talk about all the dashed dreams and da actually just increased the allure of Hollywood for a lot of people because it gave it kind of the the excitement of of danger and of you know I, I oh. wonder if they actually had exactly the opposite effect. Oh, I think I think you're probably absolutely right uh, that they could have had the opposite effect because Hollywood also did have the the allure of danger and adventure. Hollywood was perceived in the great American heartland as a dangerous place. Movie people were dangerous people. <laughs> movie people were immoral people. Uh, movie people, you know, had lots of sex, lots of marital infidelities, all of that, which we associate with Hollywood. Yes, and even in the fan magazines themselves, the same... Uh, the same article, the same writer, would both warn people against coming to Hollywood because it is dangerous, your chances of getting in the movies are slim, but then at the same time, make it seem so alluring. <laughs> and yeah. this is, uh, examining the fan magazines in the 1930s is fa fascinating because it's a consistent theme, the danger and the allure. Yeah, they both they both go together. Yeah, and then they can't because it. That's what it, I thought. You know, reading it, it sort of seems like very. Mm -hmm. But there's some other trends you point out. One of them being that most Americans by the age, if I remember correctly, like most Americans over the age of thirty, the unmarried was like twenty percent in the general population. But yet in these. In Hollywood, it was something like eighty percent of people. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't that high, but it, it was, was much higher. Yeah, like way, way yeah, more yeah, single people. Yeah. So that's that's also really an interesting. Fight. How do you think that shaped the culture of the place? Well, that's a very good question, and it's one. It's certainly one of the things I want to get uh, a handle on. Uh, the um, the novel that I cite that I cite at the beginning by McCoy, that you can't go home mm -hmm. from Hollywood, uh, has a man and a woman living together, a single man and a single woman sharing an apartment. And this, of course, in the 1930s, was you know a pretty, cool, pretty radical idea. I mean, it certainly happened, but certainly in the dominant culture, the idea of a single man and a single woman living together was not something that should happen. You know, yet here it, here it was and presented as a kind of normal thing in Hollywood. I'm not sure it was all that normal in Hollywood. I've seen some instances of that. But uh, it was shaping a culture, I think, where relationships with people did not, depended increasingly not on family connections or on marital connections, but on finding oneself in similar kinds of situations where everything was up in the air, where the normal rules were no longer counting as much for them. So I think it, it actually was... Uh, 
you can foresee in some ways an America of the future in this. Yeah, these transient where there, cities where transient everybody's from somebody cities, else. and yeah. Everybody's from somewhere else. Uh, people are moving around a lot. People are not getting married. People are not having kids. So this is definitely not the American norm then. Yeah. And I suspect it's the norm that the Hollywood norm is the norm in some other places like neighborhoods of New York City and stuff like that. But uh, definitely not the American norm yet. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, I can see what you're saying, but doesn't it also kind of harken back to to an American tradition that you find? I can't remember the name of the author, but it's a book I read a number of years ago. It was called Confidence Men and Painted Ladies. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Who wrote that? I can't remember oh, her name. Uh, yeah. Uh, I know the but, book. Yeah. Mm. And she says that the problem you had in a lot of these Western cities that just popped up like right. mu mushrooms mm -hmm. like overnight and mm -hmm. is that everybody's from s somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Nobody has any like long-term family connections in this place. And so you run into the problem that people can just reinvent themselves, which is the allure of the West that you can just abandon your family. You know, I remember you told me uh, when you were in New York going to this like museum and tenement museum yeah and it showed mm -hmm. like all these ads where they were trying to find this husband right. who absconded to mm -hmm. the west and like abandoned his family and his wife and kids and mm -hmm. everything and you could do this out, out west you could reinvent yourself go out there and try and make your make your fortune and that's attractive to a lot of people but the downside of that is that because you don't know the people you're meeting and because you they don't have friends that have known them for 10 20 years. it's like mm -hmm. if you apply for the fbi or the cia or CSIS in canada they one of the things on the application is they want uh references from people who've known you for 10 years or more and some of them even ask more like so they want to know who you are from somebody who's known you from for a really long mm -hmm. time well in these frontier places nobody's known you like and so you can be you can be a you know a serial killer back in Boston, <laughs> like, or you could be more likely mm. you could be somebody who's declared bankruptcy three times and has screwed over lots of people in Philadelphia and in New York and stuff like that. And so they they have this constant anxiety of in these Western towns, and so they come up with this these various ways of trying to. And you remember the Tappan brothers? They yeah, came up with their that they came up with the the credit reporting system which is now used all over the world. It was started first in the United States, and it was a way of trying to catch these people who would you know, screw over lots of people back in Chicago and then move to L.A. I mean, so do you see a continuity between that, that kind of frontier culture and what's happening in Hollywood? Yes. To some extent, I do. And certainly what I'm finding has precedence. Um, Going back to larger pat other patterns, I'll, I'll get back to the, to the frontier, but in other patterns of migration, sure, people come, came to the United States, people came from Ireland, from Germany, from Italy, wherever. But of course, one of the things that they desperately tried to do and succeeded in doing in most cases was reconstituting communities. Uh, their aim was not, for the most part, I think, to just uh, you know go off and for fun and fancy free, but they wanted to reconstitute communities. Uh, people, of course, going west, many of them, as you say, did not. They wanted to escape something. Uh, but there were always elements of reconstituting communities. There were always churches. There were organizations. There were clubs. Uh, in Los Angeles. Well, you said in, your neighborhood in L.A. was basically Indiana in the middle of L.A. Well, it was the Midwest. Mid yes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm not speaking here about Hollywood. Hollywood was, again, I think different. But in Los Angeles as a whole, uh, during the 1920s, 30s, even into the 1940s, one of the main ways of constituting community was the creation of state organizations. So every year there would be uh, an Iowa picnic. You know, there would be 
a Miss Indiana in California beauty contest. I mean, there <laughs> wow. would be whatever, right? But people would join these organizations that were, which allowed them to identify particularly with people from their home region or their home state. That was really, really big in California. Uh, in Hollywood, I think it was different. A lot of the migrants were individuals. Uh, people coming to other parts of Los Angeles often came as families. Uh, some did to Hollywood, too. Uh, Hollywood was diverse in that sense. But uh, my sense is, and again, I, I, I don't have all of the answers for this yet, but that people who came there um, didn't come as people who wanted to reconstitute a familiar community. They were people who wanted, who were seeking something different, who were seeking a new, not only a new way of life, but a new way of pursuing their life. Mm -hmm. Well, this is just a sort of a conspiracy theory that I was playing around with in my head when I was reading your your uh, your paper. The okay, d definitely there must have been a benefit to the film industry that you had this constant influx of eager beaver people that wanted to make it, and that was surely a way of keeping costs for extras and for people down, right? If you have, if there's, you know, 10 people waiting for your job, right, then you can pay less and you can treat people, you know, not as, not as well. And so I'm wondering if, um, do you have a sense that the film industry had something to do with these fan magazines and these like celebrity magazines that were almost kind of luring people in like into Hollywood constantly like did they have a hand in you know I just yeah no I, I I hear what you're saying and you're I think partly right and to indeed to a considerable extent right uh, the fan magazines were not owned as such by the studios the gossip columnists like Hedda Hopper or uh, um Sheila, Sheila Graham, people like that, Luella Parsons, didn't work for the studios as such, but they had to have the cooperation of the studios because the stars, whom they were mainly interested in, uh, were not people who were free agents. They were people who were under contract with the studios. And so the relationship between the gossip columnists, the fan magazines, and the studios was absolutely an incestuous one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a scene in the movie Garden State, which I mm -hmm. I, I love that movie. Um, it's actually it's Annalisa's favorite movie. <laughs> but uh, there's a scene in Garden State where he's in Hollywood and he's somebody who's been trying to mm -hmm. make it as an actor and mm -hmm. he's had some sort of roles that did well but he's, he's sort of middling success mm -hmm. but he's to make ends meet he still has to work as a waiter in a restaurant yeah. and so there's this scene where he shows up late to his job and his manager is chewing him out and he says you know how many people apply for your job every single day and his Im implication is that they're all coming to hollywood because they want to make it in the film industry but they end up having to work uh, as, a, as a waiter or you know, these other jobs right mm -hmm. and so it ends up having all of these downstream effects on the la economy where everything from restaurants to cafes benefit from the fact that you have these, right? You have all of these uh, people coming in, right? So the, uh... hello. <laughs> we have Matthew Ace. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, we have just been joined by movie critic and professor Matthew Hayes, which is wonderful. And they were just talking about some movie called, what, The Swimmer? The Swimmer with Burt Lancaster from 1968. And I've never seen... Who directed it? I, I forget, but it, there was a controversy that it was sort of taken away from the director and recut because it was so weird they couldn't, the studio couldn't handle it. And then it, it was 
uh, it was resurrected and refurbished into a, as close as they could to the director's cut, and and it's made the rounds again. It, it was, there's a Blu-ray edition, but it's it's a, it's a Marvin Hamlish score, I think. It's like mm -hmm. it was a spectacularly strange film, you know, just because I'm getting caught in the rain. It's a cold, rainy day today. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, <laughs> of the ending of the film. Because, but Bert, it's I think Burt Lancaster is remarkable in it, like remarkable. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, that's I, well. We were talking about the sort of the golden age of of film, like the '30s and stuff like that. But this is this period in the late '60s and '70s, especially the '70s, is like is also really fascinating. It's so dark. The kind of taxi driver era, like you know, you know, you know underbelly, underbelly and everything. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Well, the '70s seemed, was a remarkable decade. That was no. uh, the, I mean, the last great decade, right, no. for Hollywood. But mm -hmm. the it ended with Raging Bull in 1980. But I think that. Uh, I, it's funny, I was I'm teaching a horror film class right now at Concordia, so oh, wow. uh, last class I taught Planet of the Apes, same year, 1968, and I mean, everyone, the students didn't, many of, most of them didn't know the ending, and so it's really interesting to hear their perspectives on it, and how germane it is now, it's really weird. Like, one of the students said, you know, Dr. Zayas sounds like Mike Pence, you know? <laughs> so, and there's just, there's just this incredible, there's this incredible resonance that the film has today that's so interesting. It's like, that period, you're right, was so dark, and he was so, not only were the, I mean, obviously the apes were like this sort of parody of American society, but like, Charlton Heston was so awful. He was so really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. you, knew, you couldn't root for him either, right? There was no one to root for in the film. Yeah, that, the best thing about the movie when I saw it when I was a kid was that final scene. Yeah. It just completely blew my mind. Like the idea, because I was all into like National Geographic yeah. and archaeology and the idea that you can have these great civilizations and they all eventually end and then somebody finds like the, the ruins and and to think, wow, my civilization could end. No, that was the yeah. beginning of my nuclear anxiety. That ending was just, <laughs> as a, I think it's one of the first things I remember seeing as a kid, and it just completely... Oh, mine began a lot earlier than yours. Yeah. <laughs> mine began in the 50s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. With duck and, with drills, duck and right? cover. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, we had to do those drills. Well, I'm teaching Godzilla tonight, so talking about, you know, mm -hmm. the, a monster that actually literally yeah. came from ato atomic dreams mm -hmm. and atomic nightmares, right? So, yeah. so it's... Uh, yeah, that the ending is is really crazy. And someone I read someone recently commented that it was a really bad nuclear war because the Statue of Liberty ended up on the coast of California. <laughs> <laughs> well, two great films to pair for the 1950s are uh, The Incredible Shrinking Man and The Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, right? <laughs> and the, the man is shrinking the woman. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's true. Both, from, both as a result of nuclear yeah, it's radiation. A, the, the, yeah, the, they upset gender roles. Exactly. Yeah, the cata yeah, the catastrophe is that, mm -hmm. yeah, the catastrophe is the man gets smaller and the woman gets bigger, right? It's, yeah. just, it's, tr it's Trump and Hillary all over again. Yeah. <laughs> have you actually paired those two in a class? Yeah, that's a great How part. did the students respond oh, to it? <laughs> Really, I, they couldn't believe it. They, 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 <laughs> they, they, back mean, then, I yeah. mean, the um, uh, the attack of the fifty foot woman. I mean, it's such a terrible movie, though. I mean, it's like that's great. That's great. I I also show um, tonight. I'll also show uh, the war game. Peter Watkins, mm -hmm. um, the first mockumentary mm -hmm. that actually won an Oscar. Um, I've never seen it. What is, what is so it the war game uh, basically grew out of uh, it was the wave of 60s anxiety after the Cuban mm -hmm. Missile Crisis. So um, at that point, um, the British more conservative politicians were saying, "Well, we could have a we could have a, a minor nuclear war, and we we could win it with the Soviets." So there was this sort of ridiculous discussion about that. So he actually made with non actors. Mm -hmm and on a very low budget, he just made this film, got BBC to give him some money, and made this mockumentary. This is what it would look like after a nuclear war. And he interviewed all, all these experts to show what would happen to people and how it would society would break down and rioting would, would occur and the whole society, and people would go blind and how horrible it would be. And some students leave the room. I mean, it's, very it's a very disturbing film because mm -hmm. it feels very, very real. And when the BBC saw it, they said, well, we can't show this. We can't possibly show it. And they said they threw up the War of the Worlds excuse and said people might think it's real because it's so realistic. But really what they were afraid of was a backlash from politicians mm -hmm. in Britain. So Watkins was furious, obviously. So they said, look, 
take it, you can take it to the festivals, take it to wherever you want. So he took it to Cannes, where it was an immediate sensation. It got, a, I think, a special award at Cannes, and it started playing everywhere. It's only 45 minutes long. It's completely haunting. It's completely haunting. There's, I think there's a Criterion edition. I mean, it's like really, really, really good. Hmm. You know? Yeah, it, it, it is. It, it's it's oh, really compelling. It yeah. 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 Well, it, I've heard that from lots of, uh, you know, Mario Del Mar, like he, he also is really into horror films and he teaches at John Abbott. And he, he's always like explained to me what vampire movies are really all about and what uh, zombie movies are all about. And he, he, he makes a very similar claim than what you said with zombie movies. He says, these are all sort of trying to understand, you know, what happens when civilization collapses. Like what are people like after? And so the walking dead is, is really just about, you know, a kind of horrible, like post-apocalyptic, you know, I don't know if it's actually how true it actually is. But but, I mean, people are fascinated by this, this idea of what happens (laughs) to us. If there's a catastrophe, what happens to the survivors? I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. It's a kind of like, there's a real frisson. Yeah. It's a a little Lord of the flies type thing. Like I find, you know, you'd think they'd run out of things to do, but I do think it's really clever in The Walking Dead the way that they introduce all of these ethical conundrums into it. Like, there's that one that one season where they they come upon a farmer who is actually containing the zombies in a a barn because one of them is his daughter Mm -hmm. who's now a zombie, and he said, "Well." I, if I'm Christian, it's wrong to kill. Therefore, I can't kill the zombies, right? I have to leave them and feed. He's feeding them. <laughs> He's like taking care of them, and the others can't understand it. Yeah. There's also the, there's what that, there's that that season has some of the best lines ever. Yeah, like when he when he says, you know, our Lord promised us the resurrection of the dead. We just didn't think it would look like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the best lines in the entire. No, show. it's great. And George A. Romero said when he was asked about it, because of course he denied the Living Dead, which they owe it all to him. He said, well, it just seems like a zombie soap opera. And so someone said, well, isn't that the point? And he later said, um, which was, I'm glad he said this. He, he actually sort of amended his opinion and said, actually, if, on second thought, I think it's a really interesting show. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad they're making it and they've made, managed to sustain it for so long. And it's interesting. And so I'm glad that he managed to say something nice before he passed away, you know, because I, mm-hmm. I think it is his legacy. And it, it's, it's a great, it's a really interesting show. So, so what, what do you, I mean, what do you think, think this says about, about American society, society that they produce these, these kinds of movies or anything, you know? Oh, I mean, well, if you go back to the 1950s, obviously there's the fear of nuclear, of nuclear war and the Cold War, the whole Cold War mentality and environment. I mean, it was omnipresent. If you didn't live through the 1950s, you really have, I mean, it's not something we thought about all the time, but something we thought about regularly. I would I would sit in the car even thinking about it. And a lot of us thought there really was going to be a nuclear war. You know, sooner or later with it was good, going with to good happen. reason. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, it certainly could have. So uh, there were these incredible anxieties, but there were, you know, other anxieties obviously in American society about changing gender roles, uh certainly um, the the sort of disruption of of traditional norms as a result of the war and, and so film noir, migration film noir pattern, and the melodrama film noir and the melodrama yeah. Uh, yeah I mean there were there were a lot of things going on in American society that I think contributed to that I mean it also contributed to a kind of conservative politics Mm -hmm. in the 1950s. Uh, The whole Eisenhower phenomenon, I mean, Eisenhower was reassuring Mm -hmm. because Eisenhower represented traditional norms, traditional communities, and so on. And, um, you know, I think of of a movie like coming, well, coming, what is it, the very end of the must be about 69 or 70. I'm thinking of, um, you know, the Clint Eastwood, Oh, Dirty, Dirty Harry. Dirty Harry. Yeah. Oh, Dirty, 71. Dirty ha- yeah. yeah, 71. Yeah. Dirty Harry, uh, where you're now getting, you know, reflecting a real conservative reaction. You know, if you want to talk about gun culture in America, you know, look at the Dirty Harry movies. Look at, look at, the, look at that. And, and the, it's a, it's a, you know, a, a validation of America's worst fears about criminal in their midst, the shooter in their midst, the guy, the law and order. That's 
and that was a that screenplay was a direct response to the Miranda decision of mm -hmm. the Supreme Court in '66, um, in which they said, "Well, you didn't." The Supreme Court said you did not read Ernesto Miranda his rights. Therefore, mm -hmm. they threw out his conviction. Mm -hmm. um, is subsequently oh, absolutely thrown was. in prison because yeah. he did, in fact, rape this woman. So. Uh, and that was a split split decision right down the line of like four to five or whatever it was, five to six, whatever the, rest of the numbers were. But there were not one, but two dissenting opinions. It was very controversial. And they wanted John Wayne for that movie um, wow. because they felt that he would be perfect because he would represent old values and the generation gap. But Wayne said, well, what? why are you making a Western, why don't you do, and setting it in San Francisco, why don't you just make a Western? He knew, he saw that it was a Western. So he refused and he re never re stopped regretting it because of course it became a huge sensation. They actually offered it to Paul Newman because oh. he had, and oh. he said, well, and he, Paul Newman, of course he was on Nixon's enemies list. He said that was the, my proudest achievement. But he said, well, this is a really a right wing movie and I'm not right wing. He said, you know, why don't you take it to Clint Eastwood? So Paul Newman is the reason that Clint Eastwood got that role. It's wow. hard to imagine it without Clint Eastwood. It's impo yeah. Well, yeah, impossible now. Yeah, I just now. can't imagine it. But yeah. he's such an icon of the right, you know. But the mm -hmm. interesting thing is the, the sequel to that film, Magnum Force, the mm -hmm. first sequel, is really interesting because it's a director named Ted Post who did a lot of strange films, including Beneath the Planet of the Apes, the first sequel in that uh, franchise, and also uh, The Baby, a very weird cult movie. But in Magnum Force... Uh, Dirty Harry's become a legend, and there's these this rogue police force, underground police assassination squad, and they go around, if somebody gets off on a technicality, they go and kill them anyway, right? They assassinate mm -hmm. people. And so they approach Dirty Harry, and they say, you're one of us, you know, you're, you're this rogue cop, right? And he actually says to them, guys, what you're doing is wrong. He says, the court system is, is a really flawed, but it's the best thing that we've got going. You can't just go around shooting people for jaywalking, for God's sake. So he actually contradicts the first film. Yes, it's not the, the implication that you would draw from the first film no. at all. No. And uh, I think that was probably, I, I don't know the history of the second film, but I would imagine that there was an intention there. Yeah. I, yeah. I saw to, actually to, a continuity. To, to say, yeah. whoa, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah, we get, we wait, don't want people to draw far. the lo wrong conclusions. But I, I saw a continuity <laughs> between, I mean, I, I, the Miranda connection makes perfect sense to me. But I also saw a kind of a connection to the whole Mike Hammer novels from the 50s and stuff like that, where um, there's this feeling that you, for justice to be achieved, you need to have people who work outside of the law. Right, that the law doesn't work if you just play by the rules. That th things get done when somebody sort of cheats. Right, like that's. Yeah, well, I mean that's implicit also in a lot of detective fiction. I mean, certainly in Raymond Chandler, the law is corrupt. Yeah. In Raymond, Ch it's the cops who are corrupt. Yeah, and, and I mean in film noir, Phil Marlowe has to set. Yeah, in straight. film noir, the running trope is that, mm -hmm. you know, the film noir hero has his own ethical and moral code, yeah, but he's absolutely. really right. It's that everyone's corrupt, mm -hmm. but he somehow is, is, is kind of intuits the correct thing. Yeah. You know, like even like in a neo-noir like Chinatown, Jack Nicholson is essentially the most moral character, yet he's still fundamentally flawed, but he's, mm -hmm. he's the one who tries to save Faye Dunaway at the end, yeah. right, from John Huston. So what is the difference between something like... Uh, Dirty Harry and film noir. Like, what is, like, how, how are they different or are they part of the same tradition? Or, mm, I wouldn't call it film, film noir. No. It's a sort of, I'm Dirty Harry was sort of an early, vig, like a vigilante movie, which I think is interesting. Joe is another really interesting example with Su a young Susan Sarandon in it, which is a really great vigilante movie, which most people haven't seen. Um, and as you say, it's more like, it, like a Western. It's a Western and it, and it's also just like a, deeply reactionary film, mm -hmm. right? It's basically, a ba like mm -hmm. Pauline Kael said in her review of it, like this is a fundamentally a fascist, a fascistic film. And she said, um, it's intentional that they've said it in San Francisco. She said, I grew up in San Francisco. My mother said, don't trust the police, whatever you do, you know? <laughs> so she knew that the police, no one believed the police in San Francisco. They weren't to be trusted there, right? So it was very intentional to in the middle of like sort of the hippie gay capital of, of, of America to put this cop who was going to set everything right by shooting the bisexual killer who is clearly getting off on um, the scene where he hires a black guy to beat him up. He's he's getting off on it. Like, mm -hmm. it's really twisted. It's a really twisted film, yeah. right? And 
Uh, and of course, then in a subsequent sequel, he says, make my day. And then Ronald Reagan quoted him. So that's when he really became, mm-hmm. you know, his I- iconic status was cemented at that point. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I always saw the connection between Rambo and Dirty Harry and Reagan also saying, you know, next time I'm going to send in Rambo. It was just yeah. this really weird, weird thing where like fantasy and reality are merging and it's an actor who's now president. It's like, what the fuck? But I mean, fuck? that's always, like, that's always been true with Hollywood. And I mean, but in going back to the uh, earlier question about film noir and uh, its relation to Dirty Harry, I mean, Dirty Harry, the, the, the bad guy is clear and it's clear absolutely. why he's a bad guy, you know, and in film noir, the the danger is always lurking somewhere. Yeah. It's in the shadows. You're never quite sure where the danger is and how it's going to have an impact on you and how the protagonist in the movie is going to confront the danger. It's uh, more nuanced Ab- than oh, Dirty a- Harry. Absolutely. absolutely more nuanced. Absolutely. I mean, there's there, apart it's, from the whole stylistic. Yeah. Yeah. Question. It's it's so clear that it's so uh, so clear that 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 and the guy that they dream up is the evil guy who's just so over the top, right? Yeah. That a there's degenerate. Just a degenerate. <laughs> who's, and, Every everybody's and the, the, idea of you know, a the, degenerate. The penultimate scene is is him hijacking a busload of children, like and hitting one of the kids. Like there's just no way. You just think, yeah. well, like, the only solution to this is a bullet to the head from a big, great yeah. big gun like a Magnum. I mean, that's just all you can think of. But some people have argued that that film is so ludicrously over the top and and obviously right wing. That it's actually less insidious than a lot of other Hollywood films where the ideology is sort of sneakier, right? So, um, and I think that's a really interesting, I think it's George Tolles who made that argument in a, in a really, really great piece on Dirty Harry that I use in class. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, the, the torture scene is remarkable. I mean, again, this is a sort of defense of torture that takes place in the football field, so this all-American mm-hmm. arena. And it's like this is sort of it's sort of this pornographic scene where he's shot him and then he's he's stepping on his wound to get the confession out of him right about where the girl is, and it, it's a it's it's such a twisted scene. It's just a remarkable one of the best uses of a helicopter shot I think I've ever seen in a film, and it's sort of beautiful uh, and s- so disturbing, and even like there's so many Reagan themed um, era Reagan era themes in it like. The idea that the mayor is this sort of buffoon who doesn't really understand the evil, right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. so it's like Reagan said, is, is when he's asked, "Is government the problem, or what is the problematic about government?" He said, "Government is the problem, right?" This idea that we just need to get government government out of the way and everything will be really good, mm-hmm. and like, it's kind of like that's brimming in that film as well. He stands I, in for the liberal. Yeah, the mayor. Yeah. Yes, he does. The, yes, the liberal the, enemy, the, the ineffectual mayor, enemy. and then they even yeah. have a a lawyer who's a professor. Who comes mm-hmm. in and says, "Well, you mm-hmm. broke this. You broke uh, his rights and uh, this constitutional amendment and this one and this one, and therefore, uh, you know, you've you've broken, you you've breached his constitutional rights several times over, and uh, we couldn't. Uh, most we could get him for is possession of weapons, and even that'll be thrown out because you illegally obtained those weapons. You broke into his home, so it's all you know. You've you've just completely screwed this whole thing up, right? So it's like the the mm-hmm. the liberals and the academics are getting in the way of." Of justice, but I always um, I the, the the film that I show right after that one is uh, after um, Dirty Harry is Dog Day Afternoon, because mm-hmm. that's you know that's a sympathy for the devil movie, right? Al Pacino is this uh, bank robber who's kind of bumbling, but well, very bungling, and suddenly he and his his cohort find that they're in in the uh, bank and surrounded by police. They've got to negotiate with police. But then it becomes clear that he was actually robbing the bank to pay for his lover's sex change operation. So like in the last piece, people in 1974, <laughs> you would have sympathy for, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. These guys. But then as the film goes on, you get, you kind of get this, you know, uh, the director, Sidney Lumet, gives us kind of the Stockholm Syndrome. We start really believing that these people are real. Very sh- no, no soundtracks. So it's shot very much almost like a documentary. And very intimately, it's one of Pacino's greatest performances. Um, and you start to really have sympathy for them. It's really incredible. It's like the mm-hmm. opposite of Dirty Harry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's pretty fascinating. I st- I got to see that movie. You told me about it. I, I what I find interesting is just to go back to an earlier thread. Is I'm 
just finished reading Masha Gessen's The Future is History, and now I'm reading her book on the rise of Vladimir Putin, and it's called The Man Without a Face. And she talks about how Hollywood movies had su- have had such a big effect on the Russian electorate that part of the way that Putin rose was by employing this kind of Dirty Harry and Rambo rhetoric after the apartment uh, apartment bombings that were happening all over Russia. He, he said these things like, you know, we're going to like, uh, we're going to, we're not going to take the gloves off. We're not going to follow the law. And he really kind of shamed all of the liberal politicians and said, these people are too obsessed with process. They're too obsessed with like justice. We need to uh, just go after them and take any, but it's all, and he quote, he specifically quotes Hollywood movies. And so this has kind of become uh, exported worldwide, right? This is something that uh, dictators in the third world and all over the place use this language to actually justify. And this is partially, I think, maybe what Trump tapped into when he said, we're going to go after, we're going to torture them, we're going to do worse than waterboarding, we're going to go after their families, and his popularity soars, right? In the same way that when Putin says, we're going to go after the terrorists, and if we find them in the outhouse, we will like <laughs> kill them right in the outhouse. And this one comment was repeated all over the media, and his popularity soared to over 80% because of this one kind of comment. Yeah. So it's... Oh, it's hard to judge Putin's popularity, actually, it seems to me. Because Just, the, the people who are yeah, gathering the stats are not yeah, very I mean, it's, trustworthy. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard to judge it, I think. And um, yeah. Well, Trump's Trump's is and Trump, Trump's it's popularity 42%. Hasn't, hasn't exactly soared. It's, it's been within a range of about 6 to 8% throughout his... Te- it's ranged from the high 30s to the mid 40s. So it hasn't, I wouldn't describe it as sore. I would just describe it as intensely polarizing because it, I was just looking at the, at the numbers and it's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 87% of Republicans. So it's a very high approval rating among Republicans, uh, only rivaled by George W. Bush's approval ratings directly after 9-11. So, but among Democrats, he's hated. So whether or not that hatred can get people out in the midterms, we have to see. Um, and then there's also the quarter or third of the electorate that is independent, that yeah. isn't in either party. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, and I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm the mind boggles because, as many conservative commentators have said, he's not really, he's not really even a conservative. George F. Will has left the part Republican Party over Trump, and uh, David Frum is one of his sharpest critics, and they're obviously both have conservative credentials, and John mm-hmm. McCain doesn't like him either. So. It's uh, it's very strange times for the Republican Party. But interestingly, the never Trumpers are often the same people who led the United States into the Iraq war. Yeah. You know, I don't, uh, you know, it's fine that they're critical of Trump and I agree with many of their criticisms, but uh, these guys, you know, have a history too. Of course, yeah. and, a lot of blood, uh, blood on their hands. A lot yeah. of blood on their hands. Yeah. No, that's very, do, do you think Trump is, is tapping into this whole dirty Harry kind of tradition? Like his, his speech um, that he gave to the police uh, was definitely tapping into that in a huge way. When he said, um, "You know, when you put your he- head over your hand over their head when you're putting them in the car so that they don't bang their head," he said, "Don't bother doing that. R- you know, you can rough them up." And the police behind him were laughing. And the next day, the P- police chiefs' association issued a statement saying, "We really." This is not what we need. <laughs> I mean, there's already all these instances of police brutality, often racialized police brutality that are being captured on cell phones and the footage is going viral. So we clearly, if anything, need somebody who's saying, well, actually, we need to make sure that people are, when they're arrested, they're treated humanely, not not making people more trigger happy or, you know. It, but that, I mean, everything, Andrew Coyne had a really good call in this morning in the National Post. Everything this guy does is just ridiculous. I mean, he's just a ridiculous person. It's just it's, it's, it's clear as day. You can't so deny it. He's not a, a rational, sane, but dangerous, nonetheless. Yeah, not in, he's not. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. well, he's president. <laughs> I mean, why you would make someone like this president? But he's not even really intelligent, and we don't even really know that he's some financial guru because he's never shown us his tax returns. I mean, mm-hmm. one of his biographers said. I don't. I think he's probably maybe worth fifty million. He's not even a billionaire. He, he said he was a billionaire, and the media ran with it and called him a billionaire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if he, I don't think, I, I buy that. I don't think he actually was a billionaire, but he sure is now. Yeah. 
because I mean the way that he has his family has enriched themselves you know with the pre- it's just unbelievable and I'm sure what we're hearing about with the Michael Cohen revelations is just the beginning right? well we'll all know sooner or later we'll all know yes yeah. we hope have you, have um, you heard about this thing where the the Magnitsky the they're proposing it was in the McLean's I think it was they they said we need to have something like a Magnitsky act for the Trump corporation you know the way mm-hmm. it, it to specifically targeted the Russian oligarchs yeah. rather than the Russian economy in general. Like if we just if countries just targeted the Trump Corporation, that would you know hit them where hit hit them where they hurt. Right, right. right. But yeah, um, going back. Yes, yes. Please going, do going back to actually Don Siegel who directed <laughs> Dirty Harry yeah. and Invasion of Body Snatchers. And I was going to uh, raise. Uh, the the question about invasion of the body snatchers, uh, a quintessentially 1950s movie, mm-hmm. and uh, which has been interpreted in a variety of ways uh, as a kind of right wing critique of the communist menace. The communists are among us. They look just like us. They're our neighbors, or a critique of, going back to the swimmer, the alienation of suburbia well, and ma- consumer ma- society and McCarthyism, and yeah. McCarthyism in the 1950s. Yeah. Matthew, what do, you, what do you think of that? Well, I, How would you stand on that I debate? Would, that is uh, interesting because I, I just showed that a couple of weeks ago in the horror film class too. And it is um, perhaps the best example of what in film studies is called an open text ideologically. Mm-hmm. It, it can be received in exactly as you say, in, in diametrically opposite ways. If you showed it to a right-wing audience in the 50s, they would say that's clearly a, a cautionary tale about the encroaching communism, what communism does to us. It takes away our emotions. We have no passion left. We have no individuality, you know. Uh, and the exact opposite was about the, the conf- as you say, a crit- critique of the conformity of the period and, um, uh, and of McCar- McCarthyism and paranoia. So it's... Um, Everyone said when Don Siegel made Dirty Harry, they said, "Aha, that was a fascist film." Because <laughs> there's the, there's the smoking gun. Right. He made Dirty Harry. Literally, he made the smoking gun, the smoking mm-hmm. magnum. But um, I still see it as it could be either way. And I always I always pose that question to the students, mm-hmm. and they kind of have to look for clues, mm-hmm. you know. But it it could it, to me it's it's like it's it's an open text. It could be seen either way. I absolutely love that film. It still scares me. Oh, yeah. And the remake that they made in seventy eight with Donald Sutherland, Leonard Nimoy, and uh, Art Hindle and Jeff Goldblum is actually, I think, one of the best remakes of any film ever. It is a remarkably uh scary film and especially uh post Watergate, it's like it brings this paranoia up to date and all the conspiracy mm-hmm. stuff. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's really scary. It's a really tremendously scary movie. It's really great. They're both, are, they're both, both great films. It's been remade a couple of times since not to any great yeah. effect. Yeah. And going back to film noir, I mean, another film where the text is totally open-ended, it seems to me, is the best of the anti-communist movies, Sam Fuller's Pick Up on South Street. Love that film. Which is yeah. so total, I mean, the way he plays around with the ideas of American patriotism and the flag and everything. It's, it's, so what, what happens it's in that movie? I haven't seen it. What, what happens in it? Okay, the, the premise of the movie is Richard Widmark plays a pickpocket and he picks up what is actually some microfilm of American, you know, war secrets, right? They're being carried by uh, the girl who is, what was it? Who was it? I can't remember. Anyway, on a subway. And she is actually delivering it to, unknowingly delivering it to her boyfriend, who's a communist. And so the police want to uncover this, the, the loss of the microfilm. And so they basically threaten Richard Widmark with uh, a renewed time in prison unless he cooperates and returns. He realizes it's valuable. And he's thinking mainly in terms of its monetary value. Uh, and the question is, is getting it back, and is he going to turn out in the end to be a patriotic American who does his duty even though he's a pickpocket? Oh, wow. Or, 
right? And the ending is so ambiguous because, yes, he's going to go free, but, uh, you know, he just kind of goes out with a smile on his face and, like, he's <laughs> oh, wow, trying to like... beat the rap. And... <laughs> and the other one I love that's so, that's so stra- really one of the strangest films, film noirs, was uh, Kiss Me Deadly, you know. Oh, Robert uh, Aldrich. Yeah, yeah, and, like, the ending of that film is... Where it's, yeah, it's like a nuclear, exp- like it's so apocalyptic. And the opening is uh, features a, a young Cloris Leachman getting tortured. I mean, it's like really mm. a weird film. Yeah. It's just one of the weirdest films I think I've ever s- witnessed. It's just really great. It's a great film. It's a Mike Hammer yeah. novel. Yeah. 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 I've seen that. The, I I don't know if you've seen the show The Americans. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've just, I've just started watching it literally like last night. And we got totally addicted. We it's, watched we watched like four episodes. It's so good. So good. Yeah, I mean what we've seen so far, the four episodes we've seen so far, it almost seems like it turns the whole invasion of the body snatchers narrative inside out. So these people actually are um, Soviet, you know, KGB agents that have been and it's based on true story. Yeah. And they were planted in suburbia. And they look just like typical white couple with two and a half kids. Well, two kids. And they are, you know, going to the soccer practices and ballet. And they're actually KGB activists. But so it, in a way, it kind of realizes these fears of the enemy within. But then you see how the, they're really conflicted. Yeah. And they, they, they've been in the United States long enough that they're like, oh, these people are pretty nice, you know, like. And the, the, the electricity always works and the food's pretty good and they're not bad people. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually it, the inspiration for it. I mean, it's set in, it's very clever that they set it in the 80s in the height of the, the Cold War. The Reagan, the Reagan era. Yeah. The Reagan era. Because there's one episode that's really good where they're watching the day after, which was the made for TV movie about what nuclear war would look oh, like. Oh, wow. And they're, I and they're, seen that and they're, they're really freaking out thinking like, this is what could happen, right? So, uh, but... But the true story upon which it's based, uh, the, uh, those uh, two young men, uh, they were boys at the time, learned, they had no idea. They thought they were Canadians. They learned that their parents were Soviet Russian spies, and they got sent, then they were mm-hmm. sent in by Putin, and they all got sent back. So they're actually uh, lobbying. The reason they're doing media interviews, there was a very good piece interview with them in The Guardian, one of them, is be- precisely because they, want, they said, we want our Canadian citizenship back. We, mm-hmm. did not, we didn't do this. Our parents yeah, did this to yeah, us. We're not yeah, talking to our yeah, parents yes. anymore. And um, this is fundamentally unfair. And I, I, I see their point. I mean, it's really, it's, it's a, s- a stunning story. And then that they built this incredible um, series out of it. I mean, some, some of it's a bit ludicrous. Sometimes afterwards, I, I watch some Get Smart just as an antidote. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like, because they're always getting into these crazy new costumes and like they're having sex with all these other people to get secrets. Yeah. (laughs) I had no idea spies were so promiscuous, but it's, but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to watch. And it, and the way that it's going back and looking at the cold war is really, really, really interesting. Right. Because that's, you talk about the fifties, that was my era was the eighties and having all this nuclear anxiety, right? Like where it was just, you were terrified watching these movies. There was sort of a spate of films that came out because Reagan freaked everyone out so much with all the talk of, and uh, Richard Pearl again said like people like the, the British who inspired war game, he said, well, we could have a limited nuclear war and we could win it. And probably most of it would be played out in the European uh, arena anyway saying like kind of saying Europe's expendable you know <laughs> and it was just this horror show so I mean that's what you know then there was sort of the Mad Max cycle and then there was the um, then there was like films like The Day After and Testament which was a really great film it, which showed what it would look like and Threads the British film which has just become out in a Criterion edition which is just it Threads I, saw, I actually saw it when I was living in London and it completely freaked me out I mean it was on primetime British television wow. and unrelenting like just said well this is what it's going to be like after a nuclear war it's going to be hell on earth it's going to be there's going to be a nuclear winter children are going to be dying the food's going to run out it's just going to be absolutely bloody miserable as Chris Jeff said the living will live will envy the dead right so it's like Yes, and I also show uh, what I often show if I'm talking about nuclear war, I show uh, the NFB Studio D film, If You Love This Planet, which has helped Dr. Helen Caldicott's lecture about nuclear war, which was captured very well by Terry Nash. Um, Terry found, um, went down to the States and found recently in the seven, in the late 70s, found recently declassified um, extensive footage that the American military took 
photographs and film footage of survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <gasps> Horrific mm -hmm. burns over men, women, and children. And she got, got this footage because it had just been declassified. Of course, they immediately classified it because they don't want anyone to see how bad it was after the war. Um, and so she uses montages of this footage. Um, and the, the film, when it came out, was such a threat to uh, the people who were saying, well, nuclear war won't be so bad, and we, nuclear buildup is a good idea, that the Reagan administration actually labeled the film propaganda, which oh. restricted its distribution in the United States. But that was one of the moves that backfired because then everyone wanted to see the film. It was like banned in Boston. Now everybody yeah. wants to everyone, see it. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> wants to see it. Yeah. And then it subsequently won an Oscar for Best Short Documentary. And Terry, in her speech, thanked the Reagan administration for the publicity that they had. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great Canadian moment. Yeah. Well, well we, were, we a... were talking about before, just uh, I had never heard of this before, but um, Fred was saying that during World War II, there was this... Um, this American soldier who sent his his girlfriend or wife, or whatever, sent her a, a Japanese skull. And it's a, on the cover of Life magazine. And it was, it was like her with a skull saying like, I don't know, it could be like a De Beers ad. Like, you know, so nothing says forever like a Jap skull. Yeah. I don't know. What, and, but like, so like, and as I was saying, nothing I mean, says the, you want to be with her forever. The War Department was really upset about it because this was uh, no not the kidding. image that they wanted to present. Yeah, we're not the ones that you do know, that. It was the yeah. Japanese who were the barbarians and the savages, wow. not the Americans. Oh, Can, and I'm, I want to find this. It's well, a cover of Life on, magazine. Google in, you know, in with Google a, a Images, skull. Life magazine, Japanese skull. That's just all you have to do. Absolutely, yeah. yeah and I'm you'll find check it. that out. Well, well, that's it, crazy. I mean, it's just, it's, it's certainly um, pretty stunning. You thought. Pr pretty I, I stunning. saw it pop up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. There it is. Oh, my, oh my God. That is so nuts. That's so wrong. I mean, that's um, like an ISIS snuff film. Yeah, yeah, you know, that, like it's... That's uh, really, really weird. It's certainly... When we, when we were kids in, in Alberta, and when, we, when, I was brought, when I was brought up, we were taught, when we were taught World War II history, that, you know, the bombings were just justified and the Japanese had done horrible things and the war had to be brought to an end. But, of course, many historians have said the Japanese were already very close to surrendering and, and the... The conditions of the surrender didn't change before, the, after the first bomb, and after the second, they had a conditional surrender that they wanted to keep their emperor, because uh, the Americans were demanding a no conditionless surrender. But they said, uh, "No, we want one condition." And so the second bombing was completely unnecessary. I mean, it, it's uh, pretty horrifying stuff. And when you see the footage, you can see why they wanted to suppress it, because if it had got yeah. if it had gotten out, there would have been a peace movement, a much larger peace movement, much sooner. Hmm. There was actually a rationale for the second bombing. And the rationale was, whether it was valid or not, I don't know, but the rationale was that such an amazing weapon, it would be assumed by the Japanese that there was only one, oh. right? Oh. And to show no, you know, we have this art, well, they didn't really have an arsenal, but to give the impression that there was an arsenal of such weapons, they had to drop the second bomb. There isn't just one, you know, and this is it. We can go on our merry way with the rest of the war. They had to have the second we bomb. We can destroy your entire, your I, entire your country entire, if we have to. That's I, I, I'm interesting. It's an interesting uh, defense, but it's not, it doesn't hold any water because they had they had offered a surrender after. Oh, I'm not Hiroshima. arguing that it's yeah. a compelling defense. Yeah. But there was, there. <laughs> that I mean, was, there, I know, no, that's the it line. It wasn't simply were, arbitrary that yeah. they dropped. Uh, they well, dropped I, I mean, they bomb. also it was yeah. a different. It was a bomb, a different kind of bomb. It was so they a were different testing kind of different, bomb. a different kind of bomb. Yeah. They were also showing the world who was boss. Of course, yeah. that didn't last very long because yeah. the Soviets soon got their hands on it. But they were certainly showing people who the most powerful country on earth was. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, ironically, the bomb was originally meant to be used on Germany if the Germans had gotten. Mm -hmm. nuclear weapons yeah yeah I, I just wanted to circle back to something you said before before i forget it um it fascinates me is you said we talk about like an, an open text right a, a movie that's an open text so i'm wondering if you know if you are if something is too sort of on the nose right if it's very clearly propaganda then that can backfire because it's just it's not convincing right and this is something you know, once again, I got Masha Gessen on the head right now. But like she says, like increasingly the, the public, the Soviet public became more and more sophisticated because they were always being fed propaganda. So they would just tune out when it was propaganda. And so what happened 
is uh, you had to have people who were more and more sophisticated in, pr in producing storylines that were very compelling and were not so on the nose, right? But then always you run into the problem that if a text is too open, then as you say, it can be interpreted in different ways. So, I mean, to what extent do you think film has has gone in this direction where when they're trying to make a point, you have to make it plausible enough that it's a, it's an open text enough, but then it's also pushing a point. I mean, how how do do you think they try and navigate that, or are they just trying to entertain us? And it... you, are you talking about the political arena? Or are you talking about cinema? Um, cinema, but done by people. I mean, to take the quintessential example, which I mentioned last time, which is actually a TV show. It's not a movie. It's All in the Family, mm -hmm. right? Where the people who made that show, they were very much products of the 60s they were liberals they were hippies yeah. they were trying to make fun of a of a of a racist guy right and but they because they didn't make it as propaganda because they made it uh, more of you might say an open text inadvertently they made him kind of likable and millions and millions of people saw that show and thought that it was making fun of the kids making fun of the hippies and they sympathized, yeah. right? So I'm wondering, is this always a risk when you it, try and make something? Abs absolutely, it always is. And it it, uh, it really did humanize Archie Bunker. And actually, uh, the I'm sure you saw on social media, they were showing clips of an episode that was specifically about gun control in which Archie Bunker um, does a little segment. I haven't seen this. He does a little segment on television. He gets calls up the local station, and they invite him in, thinking, well, he's just going to look ludicrous. And he actually says, the answer is not gun control. The answer is more guns so that people can shoot back. He basically says exactly what Trump has said. <laughs> yeah, he's, well, that's... He's a good guy yeah. with a gun. Really? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's uh, remarkable. The show is incredibly prescient, and uh, many people have <laughs> actually made the argument that um, Archie Bunker <laughs> uh, humanized uh, right-wing buffoonery, and that uh, Rush Limbaugh and Donald Trump wouldn't exist without Arch Archie Bunker, that he actually... Um, actually kind of helped the right. What I find really interesting is a film like Starship Troopers in which Paul Verhoeven was very intentionally, um, very intentionally actively creating um, um, a, an open text. He was parodying um, uh, all sorts of propaganda from Triumph of the Will through to Soviet propaganda through to American propaganda from the 50s. But he was doing it, he was wrapping it all up um, in such a way as in monster movies, horror movies, and science fiction, but he was doing it in such a way so that if you were a right wing person, you would you would go and you would. I remember seeing it in Montreal, and a bunch of people were cheering for you know the end, which is just a ridiculous over the top ending. So it was funny because I was laughing through a lot of it because it's obviously to me it seemed quite clearly a parody, and yet I was also kind of horrified. Um, some people actually said that that was spoke out to critics at the time saying it was a dangerous film because it was so obviously going to be misinterpreted by people as a pro-war film, right? A might is right film. Whereas he kind of meant it as a, as a critique of, neo, of the neocon idea. And when I interviewed him, he mm -hmm. said, yeah, basically that film anticipated the Iraq war, right? Like it was basically mm -hmm. that kind of mindset. And, um, you know, there are all these gorgeous, the gorgeous Casper Van Diem, he's this gorgeous Nazi kid, right? Blonde, <laughs> stunning guy, right? I can't believe he didn't go on to anything else because he was just, he was just, he was destined to be a big star. But it's, it's, and it's something, there's this torture sequence where he's being whipped. And I mean, it's all just ridiculous. And there's one sequence that's actually basically a shot by shot um, remake of part of, part of uh, Triumph of the Will. It's a really remarkable film and really toying with that. But, you know, I love, Gesson's work, but this idea of complex, like we have to create a complex narrative. Donald Trump flies in the face of all of this because uh, it was build the wall, lock her up, drain the swamp. And he even said after he won at one of these r ridiculous rallies where he was still campaigning, campaigning and railing against everyone, he said, you know, I thought drain the swamp sounded really stupid, but then I said it and some people cheered. So I just started saying it mm -hmm. like, so he was basically t coming right out and saying that I never even believed in this slogan. <laughs> I didn't believe in any of it, but some people cheered. So I kept saying it. It was like, he basically was, and they showed people at the rally who didn't know whether they should be cheering him anymore because he was basically making fun of all of them. I mean, it, I, I don't know how simplistic it could be and build the wall. I mean, 
Well, American Whoa. politics has never been strong on complexity. That's true. Absolutely. Right? And, <laughs> and, and, the, but, and, but it's, and, and, Gore Vidal said that, the United States but, of amnesia. I mean, but, completely yeah, forgotten the, the recession of 10 years ago. They've completely forgotten it and are now rampantly deregulating everything. I mean, it's like, it's bizarre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's funny. Sebastian was saying that earlier on when we were talking. He said, uh, all the jobs, he's applying for jobs. And he said, all the jobs are in the financial sector. It's all just moving money around. And clearly, that's the sector that is just growing like crazy but that's just really unstable because they're not actually making producing anything they're not making they're just you know moving money around and like that's just setting us up for another crash another like, crash yeah, another and, crash and the other argument is that the while the unemployment unemployment rate is laudably low i mean that is a good thing that it's lower uh people have pointed to the fact that there are still stagnant wages and uh people keep talking about the fact that you know inflation was a very cruel tax and we don't have inflation but I would argue we have what's generational inflation. I mean, young people can't can't possibly afford real estate the way that I could even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's all leapt way out of out of the realm of anything. And of course, educations are far more expensive than they were. Yeah. So oh, in the States, um, they totally yeah, are, yeah. So not only can you not afford real estate, but it's going to take you even longer to, if, if you possibly could get real estate because you're going to be paying off huge swaths of student debt. So um I don't know. But it's, you'll be able to afford Netflix. <laughs> <That'll>, <laughs> yeah. So, Fred, what do you think about this tension between sort of open texts and, and sort of straight up propaganda, like where they're trying to sell you on something? I mean, what? Well, I was thinking, actually, because it's the period I'm most familiar with, again, the, um, the Second World War. And I was thinking, actually, of the pro-Soviet movies like Mission to Moscow and uh, The North. There was the, the one with... with Farley Granger, anyway, uh, takes place in Ukraine. Uh, there were a few of them in the Second World War. And these were critically not well-received, generally. They were not popular movies. An enormous amount of money went into making a mission to Moscow. Huge production values. And yet it was a popular dud. And people who saw it said, you know, this is just propaganda you know <laughs> and they they saw it as propaganda um, and maybe in this instance because we think of the the, the McCarthy period and the post-war war period as being the period of uh, anti-communist propaganda but uh, if you look at newspaper I was just reading the Los Angeles Herald Express for 1940 and every issue is full of anti-communist stuff you know, the reds are everywhere. You know, so people had already gotten this. Then they suddenly see these movies made during the Second World War. And what? We're now supposed to believe this? No, they had a memory. The memory was the communists are bad. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they're not going to believe those movies that Stalin is, you know, just good old avuncular Uncle Joe. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, Hollywood movies... I don't know whether they so much in the in the earlier period had open texts as as subtexts, right? Yeah. I mean, they had they had endings in which you were definitely supposed to know who the good guy was, who the bad guy was, draw a moral, and so on. Uh, but there were always, you know, in in the better ones like uh, the better screwball comedies, there were subtexts. Yeah. 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 You know, so a subtext is different from an open-ended text, it seems yeah. to me. I, I wonder, though, how subversive those subtexts are, because I know that, like, the, the, well, the, the sort the, of, that's yeah, the it's kind of winking, right? It's that's like, a $64,000 question. Yeah. I mean, how many people, you know, sure, you know, you can, uh, you know, have somebody analyze uh, a movie like The Awful Truth and see all sorts of subtexts in it about marriage, right? Yeah. As what's-his-name does the philosopher uh, writes about film? Zizek. No, is it Zizek? Zizek. Is the American, that? the American guy at Harvard. Uh, I can't. I can't anyway, remember. Yeah. Um, you know, but those aren't apparent. To well, that was the. People. What was that movie? Hidden from Hollywood. The one it was all about, like sort of gay characters in in classic. Oh yeah, like, I mean there cinema. were all sorts of cellular closet. Yeah, yeah. But the you know the direct. The, I think the genre that really is so full of so rife with contradictions that makes it really fascinating to explore are, are you know are, are of the melodramas especially like D the douglas sirk movies because mm -hmm. the studio was always like the reason he, f he quit in the end was because he was just furious because the studio was always imposing um narrative closure and happy 
endings on his films. And so he was always underm- undermining it as best he could with performances that contradicted that and created, as you say, a subtext and created mm-hmm. doubt about the the happy closures of his mm-hmm. films. And that's why they're so interesting to watch because they're basically just all about repression. You know, they're about uh, classism and racism and sexism and uh you know, they're, they're so full of repression. I, I, even though he was a, a heterosexual director, like um, All That Heaven Allows was remade twice, but both by times by gay directors, Fassbender and um, Todd Haynes. So it's really interesting that, and if you if you listen to Far From Heaven, if you get the DVD, there's a director's commentary track in which Todd Haynes talks about the relations all, relationship between these films, between Fassbender's remake, his remake, and the original. And it's, He's such a highly intelligent director that it's fascinating to listen to his his mm-hmm. discussion about well, his analysis. Well, Fassbender was film. strongly influenced by Sirk. Yeah, and yeah. He always acknowledged Sirk's yes. influence. Yes, yeah. He was like he basically says like Sirk was a god or something. Mm-hmm. Fassbender had some great quotes. He said, "Divine was a terrorist drag queen." <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm drawing from a, like a long memory, but I remember you wrote um, a. If I'm remembering correctly, this is going back to the 90s here, but you wrote a review of The Opposite of Sex, if I remember correctly, and you made a connection to that movie, if I remember correctly. Maybe, what is your take on The Opposite of Sex? Can you... That's the film with Christina Ricci. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I liked that film a lot. I interviewed that director, and I thought... Oh, wow. Yeah, I okay. thought that was a chapter in my book. I thought that was a really funny, uh, creative film. I mean, I think it's so dark. Yeah, it's really, oh it's gosh. really dark. It's really, it was very, it was a very clever. That was one of sort of the better comedies of, that came out of the '90s. I thought, and you know, I thought it was a smart, a smart film. And uh, I mean, I love Christina Ricci and everything she does. She's really clever. I have to go back and look at it again. Lisa Kudrow's in that as well. Yep. It's good to, no, it's and a, there's that that one. I I remember the the teacher character who's falsely accused of like sexually abusing uh, one of. He's he's openly gay and he's falsely accused of sexually abusing a student. He's a high school teacher. And uh, it, it's basically because the there's a love triangle between his boyfriend and this this high school student. <laughs> and he he is, has like people throwing paint and like breaking his windows. And all he does is go out and like, you know, re- plant the flowers again. And somebody says to him, I'm really sorry about this. And he's like, are you kidding? I lived through the Reagan years. This is nothing. <laughs> it's like you know very good of harsh harsh like kind of political criticism in that but well there's that Pulitzer Prize winning play Night Mother which they turned into a film in which uh, Anne Bancroft tries to convince her daughter played by Sissy Spacek not to kill herself and Sissy Spacek says I'm I'm making plans to do mm-hmm. myself in and Anne Bancroft says you know older slightly more conservative woman she says look it's not so bad it's morning in America I mean Reagan's doing a good job isn't he and Sissy Spacek says, <laughs> and Sissy Spacek says that's one of the reasons I'm killing myself <laughs> so what do, what do you think is going to happen to American cinema now like in the Trump times like what's happening is it is it a return to the same sort of Reagan era kind of opposition between Hollywood and no, because in the Reagan era, um, the Hollywood fell into line. I mean, the uh, I called it the it was a post Jane Fonda world. Uh, we were t- uh, people in Hollywood were told that they were being too uh, didactic and lecturing people, and and that they were that they were elitist, and they basically often bought that line and made films that were often quite critical of liberals, and they didn't talk about politics. I remember Bridget Fonda being interviewed in. The interviewer said to her, do you ever want to make films like your aunt, Jane Fonda? And she said, no, I don't think we I I don't think uh, those films are relevant anymore. And people thought she was dissing her aunt. So I would actually argue that um, Hollywood went through kind of a long period of being fairly apolitical. And uh, it was complicated because Reagan was one of their own. He had been, uh, he was the only president who had ever been head of a union. He was head of the Screen Actors Guild for quite some time. I mean, he'd been pro-McCarthy, but he'd definitely been a Hollywood person. And there was his wife, who was close friends with Rock Hudson. I mean, the whole thing was just bizarre <laughs> that he was in the White House and and, and knew all these Hollywood people. Um, but uh, uh, the, the I would argue things really changed with um Michael Moore making Roger and Me. Here's a guy who made a documentary and it made tons of money. 
unprecedented for a documentary, doesn't usually make any money at all. And it was in part because he was brazenly talking about politics and corporate interests in America and had the de- deleterious effect that corporations were having on hum- on humanity and the basic working class in America. And that proved to Hollywood, they were like, oh, wow, we, we've been ignoring politics. I think that emboldened people like George Clooney and others to make films. They said, well, we can, we can talk about politics. It's okay to do it. And now that Trump has actually actively declared war, war on Hollywood, mm-hmm. um, which isn't a new thing. Conservatives denounced Hollywood. Mm-hmm. You know, they were saying it was full of Bolsheviks. I mean, that was McCarthy was, was about too. But now that, you know, Trump and Meryl Streep are having these, Streep gets up at the Golden <laughs> Globes and makes this speech just denouncing <laughs> him. So there's this sort of like, there's this sort of active, you know, fight on between them. I think Hollywood won't back down. I think they'll keep making films that react to this insanity. I, I think Michael Moore is actually working on it. Trump film right now. Oh, really? But this remains to be seen, and it depends on the mood of the American people. You know, if there is a big reaction against Trump, that's one thing. On the other hand, you know, if the mood moves in a more conservative and pro-Trump and America first direction, you know, Hollywood has crumbled before. (laughs) Absolutely. You know, and it will crumble again. Well, they were all, they were all, um, kicking themselves when The Passion of the Christ, which Mel Gibson famously independently financed, became a massive box office sensation. And they said, we realize we have been neglecting the the Christians in America who want to go and see these uh, Jesus snuff movies. So... (laughs) Uh, so uh, basically, uh, re- realized, oh my God, we better jump on that bandwagon quickly. So I mean, I, I think you're right. I think if it, it, it's the the color is green, if Hollywood, and if they can make a lot of green, they'll they'll do whatever mm-hmm. it takes to do that. You know. Yeah. So um, I mean, Roseanne is a really interesting example. I mean, it's just sort of tiresome to bring her up because she's been in all the op-ed pieces in the last week because she got fired. But I mean, the fact that that show was this huge sensation, um, and that and she's this sort of Trump supporter. And it turns out she's mentally ill. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I remember uh, just to sort of illustrate the, the point you're making about that if, if there's money in it, they'll do it, right? Um, right after the Republicans, so with, under Newt Gingrich, you know, the contract for America, when they like swept uh, Congress, and this is when uh, Bill Clinton was, was president. I remember not long after that, this action movie came out uh, called Armageddon. Right. Mm -hmm. And if I I think it was Armageddon, but I remember going to see because Fred and I would go and see action movies. It was like almost like our our, our, you know, the way other guys would go to like strip clubs. We would go to we would go to see action (laughs) movies and we would go after and have like beer and wings and stuff like that. And we went to go see Armageddon at uh, Café Angrenon. Right. And we're like, and we went right. there. Remember and we, well. we loved the we we loved the movie. It was very very entertaining. But then we were sitting there and just laughing our asses off, talking in this bar, and we're like, okay, so let me let's get the po- the politics of this movie straight. It the opening scene is Bruce Willis Greenpeace, green hitting Greenpeace. you know yeah. Yeah. hitting yeah. like golf balls yeah. onto a green piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember the yeah. America yeah. is yeah. saved by oil drillers mm-hmm. yeah. who go up onto the meteor and thrust into yeah. <laughs> like, 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 it's, it's saved by Americans, by oil drillers who thrust their American phallus into this oncoming meteor and they, they basically fuck it to death. Like, yeah. they, they, and make fun of the people who are actually trying to save the earth. I know, I remember, yeah. I remember that very clearly. The symbolism, but, talk about on the nose. The thing I, mean, I, <laughs> the thing I, do, the thing I remember di- a little differently is that I thought that was really one of the worst films I'd ever seen. I thought it was just... Oh, spectacular. we thought it was oh, terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Really awful. We thought it was so much fun. Yeah, yeah but, it, but was, it was so terrible, it was funny. You right? know the was, Earthquake with Charlton Heston, Oh, I right? love that okay. movie. Okay, then there's... It doesn't have quite the same name, but something like Earthquake came out a year or two ago. Yes. And it's also about a California yeah. earthquake, mm-hmm. right? Have you seen? Yes, both yeah, of them. Both of them. Big, okay. I'm big into disaster What's movies. Interesting. <laughs> What's interesting is that the earthquake with Charlton Heston has this apocalyptic message. At the end, there's this final sort of uh, trembler that destroys almost everything. And uh, the cop played by George Kennedy yeah. says, this was, a, this was a great city once, you know, and it's all gone. Los Angeles and Hollywood, part of the movie takes place in Hollywood. Yeah. 
Los Angeles and Hollywood are gone. How many Charles times Heston's has L.A. been destroyed? Dies. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ava Gardner dies. Well, he in and, and, the later earthquake movie, it's just the opposite. They where the Golden Gate Bridge has been destroyed, they stretch a huge American flag. You know, yeah. I think it was over the Golden Gate, yeah. if I remember correctly. And America is going to triumph again. <laughs> you know, it's this Charlton Heston movie was He and he amazing. actually was to amazing. his to his credit, um he insisted the the original script called for him to be saved and be with Genevieve Bougeau. Yeah. And when, I, when I interviewed Genevieve Bougeau, I talked mainly about Earthquake. She's mm-hmm. like, I've made other films. And I was like, I want to talk about Earthquake. But anyway, so, <laughs> uh, but but then he said, well, no, this is ridiculous. I think I, I should go after Ava Gardner in the sewer and I should I should drown and, you know, and go mm-hmm. flush down the toilet, L.A. Yeah. toilet. And so it's kind of interesting that he saw that a darker ending would be good. Yeah. He may have been uh, burned by this funny in his memoirs because... One of the original scripts for Planet of the Apes at the end had him and Nova getting shot after they discovered the Statue of Liberty. Mm-hmm. And then they kept them alive. And so then there was room for a sequel. And he hated the sequel. He gave. He said, I'm going to give you three days and I get to blow up the Planet of the Apes because I don't want any more Planet of the Apes movies. And he said, I usually really like making a film. This is the first time in my life I don't make making a film. It's going to be a really bad movie. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> well, it was, it was a crazy movie. But um, uh yeah, I think Earthquake is really interesting for a bunch of reasons. It was it was the, the dog of the genre. I mean, they'd made a couple of really good ones, including Towering Inferno, and then mm-hmm. they sort of slapped together Earthquake, and they used a, a old stock footage in it, and uh, it had it was made it in this this re- cheesy thing at the time, which was sense around, where they put these massive speakers in the cinemas, and when the earthquake was happening, everything would kind of shake, you would <laughs> vibrate, and that was called <laughs> sense around. <laughs> And uh, it was just it was just awful. You kind of got a headache. I remember as a kid, we always were passing the aspirin or a child as- children's aspirin around. We're watching this earthquake movie, but I mean, it's it's so absurd that. Uh, uh, but those films th- those films were interesting because, I mean, I wrote about them in, in the Globe. I wrote this piece about them as being uh, about America under siege. That there was there was this cross section of actors, a sprawling all car- all star cast, which was really supposed to reflect all of America under siege. Um, but the thing about them is, is they're actually very conservative films that are about Hollywood's anxiety about the new Hollywood. I mean, here was Mm -hmm. here was Bonnie and Clyde and all these young actors coming along and making really interesting films. And the studios knew that their, that their dominance over everything was collapsing. So their world was collapsing. So you had in like Towering Inferno, older, older actors like William Holden, who was a noted conservative um, close friend of the Reagans, and you had Fred Astaire, and you had these older actors alongside the new Hollywood, the people symbolic of the new Hollywood, Paul Newman, Steve McQueen, Faye Dunaway. So you had these, these the younger generation pushing out the older actors. And so there was this sort of sense that the Vietnam War and Watergate, that America was just on fire, or in the case of the Poseidon, upside down, literally upside down, right? And it was, it, everyone was just going to have to fight to survive. And that America's, the, 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 the disaster hero was still, there were still good guys. It was, it was pushing back on film noir and this idea of that there couldn't be good guys. Mm-hmm. There could be a good guy like Charlton Heston. There could be a good guy like Paul Newman and Steve, like Steve McQueen who were fighting the fire. There could be a good guy like Gene Hackman and Beside Adventure. There could still be a good hero. So there was this, it's a really interesting genre to look at because it was very short-lived. I mean, by 1980, the Irwin Allen made The Bees or some some awful film, Swarm or whatever it was. <laughs> I mean, he started making getting worse and worse and the budgets got lower and they were just terrible in the end. And then it all just kind of petered out. But... I remember, I still remember my parents taking me to Towering Inferno, and it was this event. It was like, oh, I loved it. Oh, it Towering was phenomenal. Inferno. And the other really interesting, weird, weird, <laughs> weird thing about Towering Inferno is the reason the the two studios, in an unprecedented way, collaborated because they were each had commissioned, they'd each bought the rights to two books that were about burning buildings, people trapped in burning mm-hmm. buildings. And the studios had a meeting, the executives had a meeting and said, look, we're basically making the same film here. Why don't we pool our resources? We'll get Irwin Allen to do the special effects and we'll get a, an A-list director who's done Bond movies and we'll make this into a spectacular way. All the stars together and that's what, how Towering Inferno happened. But both books mm-hmm. were inspired by the building of the Twin Towers. When the mm-hmm. Twin Towers oh, were, mm-hmm. 
when the mm. Twin Towers went mm. up, the authors looked mm. at th those towers and said, if there's a fire in that building, people won't be able to get out. They'll be jumping out to escape mm -hmm. the fire. And they, that's why they wrote those two books. That, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know a great old Hollywood, new Hollywood story. You may have heard it. I don't know. But uh, Jack Warner, back in the day, when he'd signed somebody to a, a new contract, a star, director, he'd take them around the Warner Brothers lot. And he'd point up to the water tower and he'd say, you see up there, WB, Warner Brothers, that tells you who's in charge. <laughs> okay. He did the same thing with Warren Beatty. And of course, you know what Warren Beatty replied? Of course, they hated each other. Yeah. Right. This is uh, for uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Right? Yeah. Uh, he said it also stands for Warren Beatty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that is so interesting because I was just reading uh, mm -hmm. a, about sort of an extended chapter on Warren Beatty and his mm -hmm. politics, yeah. and that he had started his own production company, which mm -hmm. a lot of actors were doing, yeah. and so he owned a lot of Bonnie and Clyde yes, and that's why and that's why he was able to turn down a lot of films because he made so mm -hmm. much money from it because and it that's so well. why he was able to write his own ticket yeah at Warner Brothers which Jack Warner just I mean this was against everything he had always yeah. represented in Hollywood right well if you think about that old system it's where the actors were owned I mean it, it yeah. was really a kind of insane like almost like a plantation like they mm -hmm. were yeah, you know, it was just like uh, kind of in, uh, 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 unbelievable. There's that it's such a dreadful movie, Mommy Dearest, but there's that scene where she's Joan Crawford's like begging, you know, Jack mm -hmm. Warner or somebody, please, was, yeah, please give me Louis B. Give, Mayer. Yeah, Louis B. One, Mayer, yeah. please give me, give me yeah. this, uh, you know, give me this part. You know, you I mm -hmm. can't, I can't, and she and he says, "Your box office poison, Joan." I mean, it's like a ridiculous yeah, it bad movie. Yeah, doesn't the contract. Yeah, but and and then of course Betty Davis had this these huge conflicts fights with the studio and they they would, would would refuse to give her a picture you know oh yeah yeah so the uh it's interesting the uh, warner brothers archives are the only studio archives that are available to researchers oh. they're held up to 1967 when corporate ownership changed wow and so they're held at university of southern california and uh they're absolutely fascinating i was looking at uh the material for the Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex for another purpose. Actually, it was because the movie that Nanette Fabre, who's in the paper, was in. Yeah. So I was looking at this file. And Olivia de Havilland, of course, was also in the movie. Mm. And Olivia de Havilland was having these huge fights with, with, um, with, with Warner Brothers and with Jack Warner. And she was walking off the set. You'd get these reports from the director, Michael Curtiz, who would write these memos to Harry Blank, who was the producer, you know, complaining about Olivia de Havilland. She wrote in, in her own handwriting, and it's in the file, this multi-page letter to Jack Warner, Dear Jack, you know, and talking about all her issues and problems and so on at Warner Brothers. Uh, not altogether convincing. She must have been absolutely awful. To work with, <laughs> and she was not showing up on the set. She'd be docked pay for mm. not showing up. Oh. She'd be docked. You miss a day on the set, you're docked a week's pay. You know that was it. And she, of course, is still alive. And at, at 101, is, is uh, sued the makers of Feud, the miniseries. And she's lost. Oh, she. I thought she, she lost. Won. No, she lost. She, I believe she lost. A oh, hundred and one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and she sued because they depict her in Feud, the famous. Uh, miniseries about the famous stories about the making of uh, whatever, uh, happened, whatever to happened to Baby Jane. Jane, which is they did really, they really did a good job. I mean, I, uh, I love. Oh, oh, it was great. Yeah. It was great. And and uh, to have John Waters playing, um, who does John Waters play in it? The famous uh, B list filmmaker, horror filmmaker, oh, the uh, Tingler. Uh, Aldrich. No, no the, not Aldrich. The Tingler. And, oh yeah. Um, uh, he he wrote. Uh, he actually wrote. Uh, came, he produced and wrote Rosemary's Baby. Oh, yeah, I forget his name. It's escaping me. But to have he was a famous sort of um, 
uh, ridiculous showman mm-hmm. made these crazy movies and uh, he's, he made Straight Jacket so Joan Crawford was in that so mm-hmm. yeah. uh, so they have him played by John Waters which is just absolutely perfect <laughs> right in the miniseries it's a really solid miniseries and it shows again with old Hollywood that you know these two aging actresses couldn't get good roles so um, they commissioned uh, it was I think uh, was it Joan Crawford commissioned the book mm-hmm. so she found this book and said let's make this into a movie and hated Betty Davis but said well let's do it because it'll be a hit and then when it was a hit all it did was mean they, they it, it kept making films like that where older actresses had to play insane people that's all they could do was play insane twisted people like they did it with Tula Bankhead they did it with all these mm-hmm. different all these older women suddenly got these horrifically misogynistic roles like it was like it didn't open (laughs) up any doors it just reconfirmed old biases i mean i guess it gave some people some jobs but well joan crawford of course as it shows in the series walked off the set in hush hush sweet charlotte right yeah she couldn't do it and then uh a young uh, the the uh, and Olivia Rod- de Havilland substituted. It, that's it. And then Rod Serling made a new series called Night Gallery. And in the oh, of the first uh, pilot, one of the uh, episodes was to be directed by young Steven Spielberg. And wow. he offered the role. It's called Eyes. And it's about a woman who, um, who an older woman who's blind. And she buys the, she, there's an experimental tr- treatment that can have an eye transplant. And so she buys the eyes of a poor man who is in debt. And so she bu- <laughs> she buys his eyes and has them transplanted. And the doctor warns her. The doctor says, I can't do this because it, you'll only have vision for about 12 hours. So it's not worth it. So uh, she says she produces a, an envelope to show him. And it's of a, a mistress that he had who had a botched abortion and died. And she says... I'll make this public and, you know, your reputation as a doctor and your family life will be destroyed if I do this. So he's forced to do this operation. And then when she finally gets her eyesight, she's in her Manhattan penthouse, but there's a blackout in New York. So she has 12 hours is ruined because she can't see anything. And this role was offered to Betty Davis, who said, I'm not going to work with someone, some unknown director. It was Steven, young Steven Spielberg before he made Jaws and Duel. And so... Joan Crawford said, I'll take it if Betty does, David doesn't want it. So it's one of the last things Joan Crawford did was with Steven Spielberg. And it's really worth seeing. It's all on YouTube, but it's only about 25 minutes long because it's one segment of of Night Gallery. But it's uh, it's really inter- kind of new Hollywood. Well, I'll have to old. check it out. I, yeah, you know, I it's really seen good. it. And she's, she's just great in it. She's completely over the top. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's just Joan Crawford on. She's just... <laughs> one of the last things she does and she's just demonic in it right she's just totally like give me my eyesight I don't care about that bum just go give him give him you know $50,000 and I want his eyes <laughs> and it's Tom Bosley the father from Happy Days is playing yeah. the guy who gives up his eyes for 50 grand or something oh my god that's, that's absolutely terrible it like, it's funny you mentioned John Waters I I loved his movies you know growing up and then I moved to Baltimore and I lived, you remember when I lived in Charles Village mm-hmm. right next to Hamden, mm-hmm. which is where John Waters is, the neighborhood he's from. He didn't exaggerate much. No. It's people are actually that insane and weird and wacky. It's I, some of the strangest things I've ever witnessed in my life were in that neighborhood. Like you could see like a person walking down the street with like one arm, <coughs> you know, yelling ah, in like a wife beater with like a strangely shaped head in cowboy boots and and Bermuda shorts. You know, like just completely insane, insane stuff. Uh, we did a book in our in our book series on female trouble. And so we had a book launch at a great bookstore in Baltimore called Auto- Atomic Books. And so I know I, it. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. I, I, I took, took the pilgrimage down there because I had to be there because the author had interviewed the whole cast of the film other than Divine, of course, who's not gone. Um, and so... Uh, John Waters was there, Mink Stoll was there, everyone was there, they all showed up. And it was, you know, some of the cast are they're pretty colorful characters, so yeah. it was really interesting to be there with everyone. And I had stayed, I w- flew into Washington, D.C., and then went to Baltimore, so I'd stayed at the Watergate Hotel. So I know that John Waters, <laughs> I know that John Waters loves tchotchkes, he loves tchotchkes, so I brought him a pen from the Watergate that said, it on it reads, I stole this from the Watergate Hotel. And he's like, <laughs> and he, I handed it to him and he said, can I have this? I said, I brought it just for you, John. It was great. 
Well, on that wonderful note, I think I just noticed the time. We have to get out of here. But thank you so much, Matthew, Fred, for coming down. It was wonderful talking with you. Talking film. And uh, pleasure. Yeah, let, let's do this again. Sure. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, just to all of our listeners, um, if you would like to support us, uh, please like us on iTunes. Uh, you can also share the podcast uh, with your friends and enemies as well. And if you'd like to support us uh, financially, you can do so at Patreon. Uh, go to our Patreon account. All right. Oh, and the link. What is the link? Is www. Sebastian, you got to do. I'm going to forget it. www.patreon.com slash Likeville Podcast. Did I get it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Okay.